I think the most interesting discovery I've made in my research about the history of First Nations and settlers is um, when Europeans first arrived, uh, um, well, a couple things. First of all, they needed the First Nations to survive. When Europeans arrived, we think they had superior technology, and they did have all kinds of really cool technology that the First Nations really uh, thought was cool and wanted to have. But um, I don't think we appreciate so much that the First Nations had uh, uh, sophisticated technology which allowed them to live uh, comfortably in all parts of North and South America, including the high Arctic. Um, Europeans couldn't survive without that uh, technology and that, that knowledge. So I, I like to think of this as two, if you like, sophisticated civilizations that come together and start to borrow uh, from each other. So that allows Europeans to establish a foothold in the territory. And what did the Europeans come for? Well, they came for many reasons, uh, to avoid persecution in Europe and, and um, start a new life. But to start a new life really means to make a living, right? To make uh, income, and, and oftentimes they're hoping to get rich. How do you do that? Well, new land, new resources, and how do you get that resources out? Well, let's just say the fur trade, for example. You need Aboriginal labor. So the history of the settlement of uh, mostly North America, South America is a little different, is a history of indigenous people uh, coming into an engagement with Europe and saying, we're going to exchange with these Europeans uh, because they have something useful for us that we want to bring into our society. Uh, and so I think the big discovery that I've made, that if, I, if it is a discovery, uh, and historians it's hard to say we make discoveries, but in fact we do, we find things that have been lost in the past, is that uh, indigenous people um, largely welcomed Europeans into the New World. They welcomed them here not as superior or not as replacements for themselves, but as people who uh, they could interact with and benefit from. And so uh, there's a way in which the whole uh, economy of Canada, United States too, uh, depended on indigenous labor in the early days. Uh, the fur trade is the most obvious example of that, but um, my own particular focus is British Columbia. And uh, you take British Columbia, uh, Europeans arrived here relatively late, uh, 18th, uh, late 18th century. Um, they started establishing uh, fur trade posts in the early 20th century, or sorry, early 19th century. And, um, and they depended on Aboriginal labor first for the fur trade, but then all of the other industries, whether it was mining, the Aboriginal people were the first coal miners, whether it was fishing, they were the first fisher people and the uh, people who work in the fish canneries. Um, agriculture, they were the agricultural labor force. Uh, they helped build the railway. We, we think of uh, Europeans importing Chinese to build the railway. Well, they did when they ran out of Aboriginal laborers. When they employed all the native people, uh, they started to hire, um, uh, uh, bring people in from outside. So the, uh, the, there's, a, there's this pervasive myth in our culture of the lazy Indian. And that myth of the lazy Indian uh, comes from uh, what I was talking about a little bit earlier. We needed these inferior races to be lazy in order to justify taking their land. But if you look at the historical facts, indigenous people went to work like crazy uh, for uh, the Europeans. And in the British Columbia case, and all indigenous groups are different, I think that's one of the kind of realizations of the last few decades is how diverse Aboriginal uh, North America was. Uh, here, indigenous people um, had this huge incentive to acquire wealth uh, because they, that was how they established status in their own culture. And periodically here on the west coast, they would hold these big feasts we call potlatches now, and they would accumulate enormous amounts of wealth, uh, uh, staggering amounts of wealth, uh, really. Um, for example, in the 1870s, when people earned a few hundred dollars a year, they would give away $10,000, $20,000 at these worth of goods at these feasts. So they accumulated vast amounts of wealth from these new resource economies, from working and trading in them, and gave it away. Uh, because in, in, in their culture, that's how you established your, your status, not hoarding wealth, but redistributing wealth. So they had an enormous incentive to go out and work for, work for with, trade with the, the Europeans. Um, and the kind of uh, social dysfunction uh, and the kind of high levels of unemployment, high levels of welfare dependency that we now uh, associate with First Nations in Canada is really a, a phenomenon that doesn't really, uh, really come into being until the sec end of the Second War, after the Second World War. So that, if you like, is, uh, is you know, the kind of area that I research and I, I suppose if I have a mission as a scholar it's to blow up that myth of the lazy Indian.